this undoubtedly will be the first Easter I have not been able to celebrate with a congregation in church. I love going to church on Easter Sunday. We have made a determination at LifePoint Church that once we are open again, once everybody can gather together again, we're going to start out with an Easter service. We'll have all the Easter songs. And, uh, and yet having said that, I'm going to preach an Easter sermon right now. It's a different one. So you hear another one when we reconvene. But there are just some thoughts I need to share as we prepare for Easter. Uh, some of you have noticed I've got a coat and tie on. I look a little dressed up for this. I I've just made it a habit through the years to always dress up for Easter. And so even though there's nobody else here except me and Kevin, who's doing the filming, uh, I still felt that we needed to do this. So let me just get into the message of Easter. Uh, about 200 years ago, Wellington and Napoleon, Wellington being the admiral for the British, Napoleon, of course, the French emperor, they were duking it out in the Battle of Waterloo. And the whole world, but especially England, was just on pins and needles waiting to hear how this thing turned out. They didn't have telegraph, they didn't have phones, they didn't have radio. And the easiest way for them to find out was when the British fleet returned, there would be on the lead ship somebody called a man with the semaphores. And what they would do is use the flags and they would send the message on what happened. Everybody was waiting. The first place that they could see the semaphore was at Winchester Cathedral. And as they watched, he started giving the message. And the message was Wellington. They, saw, they spelled it out. And then the second word came across. And unfortunately, the word was defeated. And then a fog bank moved in, and they could see no more. Well, from one station to another, they sent this message across the land. And all of England was just in a state of deep despair as they heard the message that Wellington had been defeated. Three hours went by. The fog lifted. The semaphore came out again. Wellington defeated the enemy. And all of England rejoiced. When I think of that great story, I think about Friday. We call it Good Friday. It was a time that the message might have gone out that Jesus, that Christ, was defeated. He had died on the cross. His body was in a borrowed tomb. Satan and his demons were rejoicing. Christ defeated. But then came Sunday, and the rest of the message came through the fog. The tomb was empty. Christ defeated the enemy and all of heaven rejoiced. This, mor or this morning, I'm going to share some thoughts about that Sunday, that Easter message, with that with this culmination of when Jesus had claimed before the Pharisees, he said, I am the Son of God, and I have come to save you from your sins. And the people that heard that, the leaders of the religious establishment, said, prove it, show us a sign from heaven that you truly are the Son of God, who has come to save people from their sins. Well, Sunday was coming, and the sign would be completed as Christ gave them an indisputable sign that he was the Son of God who was sent to save us from our sins. Now, let me give you a little background. If we go back to Friday, Good Friday as it's called, the first three hours Jesus hung on the cross. He was there for six hours. The first three hours were different than the second three hours. And some of the people I want to focus on today are the Roman soldiers and their leader, the centurion, that were the ones that initially mocked Christ. They were the ones that put the crown of thorns on his head. They were the ones that nailed him to the cross. But as they watched that first three hours, they saw other things go on. They heard the people go by. They watched them go by, and they mocked Christ on the cross. They also listened as Jesus was crucified between two thieves and, and how one of them uh, came to know Christ as his Savior. And Jesus said to him, because of your belief in me, today you will be with me in paradise. Meanwhile, the soldiers were doing what soldiers do. They were casting lots. 
They were gambling for the clothes that Jesus was leaving behind. The folk, as the soldiers gambled, they heard these words come from the mouth of Jesus during that first three hours, where he cried out to God, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And he was talking about a lot of people, but he was talking about the centurion and the Roman soldiers also. They heard of this. All of this was being processed. All of this was during the first three hours. Now, the second three hours came, and things really, really changed. There was absolute darkness from noon till three o'clock in the afternoon. There was an unnatural darkness. This was not a normal darkness. This was during the time of the Passover. The time of the Passover is a time of the full moon. Uh, last night I looked outside and between the rain clouds I could see the full moon. And so during the Passover, during the full moon, you can't have an eclipse. So this was not an eclipse. This was something supernatural. And it's really interesting. It's like God took his protective veil and wrapped it around his son. He didn't want people to witness the agony of the last three hours. As God the Father was pouring out his judgment on his son for my sins and for your sins. It's really interesting. I've done some reading on this. And the records that are left behind from Christian writers, as well as non-Christian writers, about that strange darkness. Uh, for example, Tertullian, who was a Christian writer in the second century, said this, At the moment of Christ's death, the light departed from the sun, and the land was darkened at noonday, which wonder is related in your own books and is preserved in your archives to this day. And it is. Uh, the, the Caesar's court astrologer, we have a letter that he sent to Pontius Pilate, asking Pilate to explain what in the world happened because our court heard about this. We saw parts of that darkness and it was centered in your place and he, he, he mentioned the time when Christ was on the cross. And then Phlegon, the Greek author, wrote this. In the fourth year of the 202nd Olympiad, that would be 33 AD. This is the time of the crucifixion. There was the greatest eclipse of the sun and it became night in the sixth hour, that would be noon, so that the stars even appeared in the heavens. They knew it wasn't an eclipse. They wanted to know what went on. And I'm here to talk today about five miracles that occurred on the cross, five miracles of Calvary. And the first one is the darkness. And I've said a little bit about that, but here's what Matthew had to say about it in Matthew 27, starting with verse 45. And that's where we're going to stay most of the time. It says, from noon until three in the afternoon, darkness came over all the land. This is during the brightest part of the day. This was a time when the judgment of God was being poured out on our sins, but on his son. And it was a time of privacy where not even the angels nor the people around should witness the agony his son was going through. That was a miracle of darkness. Now, what did Jesus experience during those three hours? Well, in verse 46, it, it, it quotes some of what he said. And the first thing he cried out in a loud voice we read is, Eli, Eli, lima sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And I can only imagine what went through the heart of his father, being a, being a dad myself to hear his son in agony saying, why have even you forsaken me during this period of time? Now, when some of those standing around heard this, they said he's calling for Elijah, the prophet. And immediately one of them ran and got a sponge. He filled it with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. And the rest said, now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to save him. All right, so here's, here's, here's the main thought that I want you to get across or that I want to get across. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. Listen carefully to this. If you miss the rest of it, make sure you get this. It says, For God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Our sins were put on Jesus, who was sinless. He was the sinless son of God. And God, who made him, 
made, or it says, for he made him, Jesus, God the Father made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be sin for us. That us includes you, it includes me, that I might have the righteousness of God because of Jesus. That's what was going on during this time on the cross. Darkness wasn't the only miracle, however. The second miracle is death. Now you say, all right, Jesus died on the cross. Was that miraculous? And I'm here to say, yes, it was. The death was something that Jesus timed. He gave up his spirit. It wasn't taken from him. He gave, here's, here's what verse 50 says. And when Jesus had cried out again with a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. And that, that word, it's not that he in fatigue and just, he was wasting away, died. He cried out. The, the, the Greek for that expresses a loud, victorious cry. He cried out in victory. Uh, by the way, John tells us what he cried out. He cried out. He shouted out, it is finished. I have finished paying for the sins of mankind. Well, they had to get his body off the cross. Because of the Passover, they had to have the bodies down by 6 o'clock. And so the centurions and the soldiers, what they would do to make sure that death was, was timely is they would take some type of a, a blunt object and they would break the legs of the individuals hanging on the cross. And what would happen is they would then suffocate because all of their weight would just be hung on the upper part of their body and they would suffocate. That way they could make sure they were dead and get them off by the ninth hour, which would be 3 p.m. They went to Jesus, and once he said, it is finished, he was dead. He, he was dead. Now, this was the time of the Passover. And at 3 p.m., they were making the last of the Passover sacrifices. Now, the Passover. You remember the Passover. That's when Israel, about 14 or 1,500 years earlier, was delivered from the land of Egypt. The night of the Passover was when they were told to take the blood of a lamb and put it on the doorpost and the lintel of their houses. And if the death angel saw the blood, he would pass over. And they had been celebrating that for like 1,500 years. Jesus is now the Passover lamb. No more lambs need to be slain. And just as he cried, it is finished, the last of the lambs were being slain in the temple. It was a shout of victory. He paid for our sins. It says, after he shouted, it is finished, he bowed his head and he gave up his, his spirit. They didn't take his spirit. He gave up his spirit. We're, we're reminded about his conversation earlier with Pontius Pilate. And, and Jesus would not respond to some of the questions of Pilate. And Pilate got after him and said, all right, now don't you realize that I'm the guy that can set you free. I'm the one that can take your life. And I'm the one that can spare your life. And Jesus looked at him and responded with these words. You have no power at all over me unless it has been given to you from above. In other words, you can't take my life. The life I'm going to give, I'm going to give up. And when he declared it is finished, he gave up his life. So we have the miracle of the darkness. We have the miracle of death. Uh, here's a third one, the division. Specifically, the division of the veil or the curtain that was in the temple in the Holy of Holies. Here's what verse 51 says, and all of these are from Matthew 27. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. What moment? When he cried, it is finished, deep in the temple in Jerusalem, something happened. Now, it, it says the, the curtain. The curtain was the was in the Holy of Holies. It separated the Holy of Holies from the rest of the interior of the temple complex. Now, you need to know that the Holy of Holies represented to them the presence of God. There was access to the Holy of Holies only once a year. It was on the Day of Atonement, and, one of the, and the high priest would go in and make a sacrifice to God. He was supposed to have accounted for all of his sins before he went in, but just in case he missed some, they feared he would be struck dead, and so they always had a rope around his leg, so in case that happened, they could pull his body out of there. The curtain symbolized to them 
the separation between God and man. The, the, the Jewish historian Edersheim wrote this, the veil before the most holy place, or the holy of holies, the, the, the veil was 60 feet high. This is not just a, a flimsy curtain. It was 30 feet wide, and it was about the thickness of the palm of a man's hand. It said, as a matter of fact, it was so massive that it would take 300 priests to maneuver this thing into place. That's the veil. And so it's not like this was just a little tight and started to tear. This is a huge thing that's overlapping in the way it was hung there. And all of a sudden, in that Holy of Holies, where they're doing the last of the sacrifices, where the priests are gathered, all of a sudden there's, all of a sudden, there's the sound of tearing. And it's got to be a loud sound. And the next thing they know, they are looking into the Holy of Holies where they're not supposed to look. And there... It's like God is opening his arms wide and he is inviting them in. No more sacrifices, no need for the priests, no need for the sacrificial lambs. God's arms are open wide and it's been open from top to bottom from God to man. Now that's quite a miracle. There's another one. Oh, actually two more. Number four, the devastation. It says, at that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks split, and the tombs broke open. Now, you're one of the soldiers. You're the centurion. You're watching all of this. You don't know what just happened to the temple, but you know what's going on around you right now. We have a supernaturally timed, specific earthquake, and the main the main uh, outcome of this earthquake is that the tombs, who are all in rocky enclosures, broke open, and the next thing you know, you're looking at open tombs. You're looking at corpses that are lying in tombs staring up at you. They're still dead, but this earthquake has opened those tombs. You say, is there another miracle? What happened to those bodies? Well, let me get to that. And number five is the dead were raised. The dead raised, Matthew 27, 52. Now, the glory of the resurrection on Easter Sunday is the resurrection of Christ. And yet God in his wisdom, lest people would be doubters, sent some more evidence along. So, it, it's, it, it, so let me take you from Friday when the tombs are opened and the bodies are lying there, to Sunday, the day of the resurrection. Jesus is risen from the dead. A group of women who were the first to be at the tomb, they loved Jesus. They were so faithful. As they approached the tomb, they questioned, now how are we going to get that stone out of the way? You know, maybe we can talk the Roman soldiers into helping us. Well, they get there, and the Roman soldiers are lying there like dead men. They weren't dead, but they're like dead men. And the stone had been rolled away. And there's an angel, actually two angels. And the angel said, what are you looking for? And they said, Jesus. Well, he's not here. He is alive. All right, now that's the message of Easter. He is not here. He is not dead. He is alive. And everything got set in motion. Remember, we saw the first message on Friday. Christ defeated now we got the last part of the message. He defeated the enemy. The enemy was Satan. The enemy was sin. And Christ had victory. Angels are going crazy, wild in heaven. I can hear the music in heaven as the angels were singing his glories. I can witness, I can think about the demons and their, their wicked leader, Satan, trembling and shuddering, saying, foiled again. We just can't keep them in the grave. But what about those open graves? Well, that, that's really the fifth miracle. Let me read from Matthew 27. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook, the rocks split, and the tombs were open. Now let me finish it. And the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. They came out of the tombs after Jesus' res resurrection and went into the holy city and appeared to many people. Wow. Wow. So it's not just a few. It says many. 
They were holy people. They were followers of God that loved God, looking forward to the Messiah. They were, I'm speculating, but probably people that had recently died. They were the ones lying in those tombs. They were restored to life after Jesus was risen from the dead. And they went into the city, and I can see them going to their homes and their relatives knocking on the door, honey, I'm home, and all of a sudden, uh, this guy that died a month ago is alive, and he's back in the city, and they were witness to what happened. The purpose? To prove the power of Christ over death. The account was never disputed. What, let me, all right, so I could stop right there, but I've got, I've got a sixth miracle. I know I promised five, but let me give you a sixth one, and that's deliverance deliverance. Verse 54. Now remember I started talking about the soldiers that were witness to all of this. They were the eyewitnesses. You want an eyewitness account to the whole thing? The Roman soldiers and the centurion. And it's interesting in the Bible, whenever you hear about a Roman centurion, they were always quality guys. They picked the best for their military leadership. They saw everything. They heard him say, Father, forgive them they don't know what they're doing. And they knew that the them, he might have been looking right at them when he said it. They had seen the empty tomb. They had witnessed the, the earthquake. They had heard the thief on the cross say, can I, can I go with you to paradise? I believe. And they heard his response, today you'll be with me in paradise. So they looked at all of this. And here's what it says. When the centurion and those with him who were guarding Jesus, saw the earthquake and all that had happened, including the dead getting out and going into the city, they were terrified. Uh, and, and it takes a lot to terrify these guys. They were terrified. And so the next verse says, and they exclaimed, here's the only explanation, the only thing that makes sense. They exclaimed, surely he was the Son of God. Remember the Pharisees wanted a sign that this was the Son of God? Well, they just got it. And the eyewitnesses that had been there for the whole time saw it. The sixth miracle, what was it? The sixth miracle is that Jesus would save the souls of the men who had crucified him and hung him on a cross. The men that had gambled for his clothes, that had beat him, the men that put that crown of thorns upon his brow, the men that thrust a, so a sword into his side, the men that mocked him, the men that spit upon him, those were the ones Jesus came to save. They were just like you and me. They were sinners, and Christ paid for their sins. During that first three hours, they had witnessed what happened with the thief, thief on the cross. Let me just read that account. It says, then one of the criminals who was hanged blasphemed Jesus, saying, if you are the Christ, save yourself and us. But the others, the other thief, answering, rebuked the first thief, saying, don't you fear God, seeing we are under the same condemnation, and we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, of our deeds but this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. You know, that thief never did a good work in his life. And he deserved to die because of his wicked life. But in his last breaths, he acknowledged Christ as the Savior. And Jesus saved him. And my hope is, as you listen to this, you might, you might consider maybe whether you're a thief on the cross, Christian, where, where you bring nothing, nothing to deserve salvation. And some of you may be at the place where you don't have much more life left in this lifetime of yours. But God will still forgive you and bring you into paradise as one of his honored children. Well, let Jesus work the same miracle of deliverance from sin in your life that he did for these Roman soldiers, for the thief on the cross, and countless millions since then. All right, now, 
I, I feel like I wouldn't have done this justice if I didn't read the account on what happened that Sunday morning. And so I, I'm going to read that, and then we're just going to close with a word of prayer. And, and here's what happened. So we got Christ. He was crucified. We heard about the bodies coming out after he rose from the dead. But, but here's the story from Luke chapter 24. It says, on the first day of the week, that would be Sunday. That's why we celebrate this on a Sunday. Early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They were going to do the normal rituals of, of tending a newly died body, the corpse. They expected to find a corpse. And they found, instead, the stone rolled away from the tomb. And when they entered, they could not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning, these are angels, stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Now, this is going to take a while for all of this to sink in. They're going to run out of there and tell the disciples. And the women were convinced a lot more quickly than the disciples. And all kinds of stuff started happening. And, and then the angel says, Remember how he told you while he was still in the Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men, must be crucified on the third day, and be raised again. And then they remembered his words, as we do this morning. Father, we thank you for the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I thank you that he was willing to pay the price for my sins and the sins of all mankind. I pray, Father, that this message, for those that is, are listening to it, might have spoken to those of us that are Christians and given us time, or given us a sense of rejoicing, rejoicing in the fact that we serve a living Savior. And Father, that we might go away from this just feeling a little more encouraged, especially in this time where there's so much uncertainty in our world. I pray that this might be an encouragement, that we might remember the words of Jesus, that he came to do this for our salvation. And Father, for those that do not know Christ as their Savior, I pray that by simply reading the message of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, they might, like the thief on the cross, say, would you please remember me? Would you remember me? And if they do, if they believe in Christ as their Savior, who came as the Son of God to die for their sins and rose victorious, we know that they will be saved. Father, we give all the praise for this with a sense of rejoicing in the name of the risen Savior. Amen.